Good morning. My name is Joanna, and I would like to welcome everyone to the JetBlue Airways fourth quarter 2022 earnings conference call. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. I would now like to turn the conference over to JetBlue's Director, Assistant, Treasurer, and CEO, Joe Cayado. Please go ahead. Thanks, Joanna. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our fourth quarter 2022 earnings call. This morning, we issued our earnings release and a presentation that we'll reference during this call. All of those documents are available on our website at investor.jetblue.com and have been filed with the SEC. In New York, to discuss our results to Robin Hayes, our Chief Executive Officer, Joanna Garrity, our President and Chief Operating Officer, and Ursula Hurley, our Chief Financial Officer. Also joining us for Q&A are Dave Clark, Head of Revenue and Planning, and Andres Barry, President of JetBlue Travel Products. This morning's call includes forward-looking statements about future events. All such forward-looking statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, and actual results may differ materially from these statements. Please refer to our most recent earnings release and our most recent Form 10-Q or 10-K for a more detailed discussion of the risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially from those contained in our forward-looking statements, including, among others, the COVID-19 pandemic, fuel availability and pricing, the outcome of a lawsuit filed by the DOJ related to our Northeast Alliance, and the various risks and uncertainties related to JetBlue's acquisition of Spirit Airlines. The statements made during this call are made only as of the date of the call, and we undertake no obligation to update the information. Investors should not place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. Also during the course of our call, we may discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. For an explanation and a reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to GAAP measures, please refer to the tables at the end of our earnings release, a copy of which is available on our website. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Robin Hayes, JetBlue CEO. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good morning, everyone. Greetings here from uh, New York City, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today. I'll start, as always, with a huge thanks and shout-out to our 24,000 crew members. We overcame many challenges together throughout this past year, and we made tremendous progress in restoring the business coming out of the pandemic. And we're set up to further build on that success here in 2023 with a disciplined plan to continue strengthening our foundations, both operationally and financially. While we face economic uncertainty, we remain focused on what we can control, and we are leveraging our unique value proposition of of offering both great service and low fares, enabled by our low-cost structure. This will result in margin expansion and robust earnings growth. Turning now to slide four, of our new deck template. We closed the year with significant cost and revenue momentum, resulting in an adjusted pre-tax income of $69 million for the quarter, and earnings per share of 22 cents. Reflecting back on the full year 2022, we made important progress in positioning JetBlue for longer term success. We hit a new record annual revenue result, a phenomenal achievement by our team given we were, we were only two years removed from the depth of the worst crisis in aviation history. We continue to see incredible demand for JetBlue's differentiated product of low fares and great service, which was recently recognized by the Points Guy with an Editor's Choice Award for Best Economy Class in the World. We launched a new structural cost program targeting $150 to $200 million of cost savings by the end of 2024. This program is designed to ensure that we are offsetting some of the inflationary increases in our cost structure and help us maintain a low cost platform, allowing us to continue to offer even more low affairs. We strengthened our network and built even more relevance for our customers by adding more service to more destinations, including significant growth out of, our, out of New York, enabled by our Northeast Alliance with American Airlines as well as building out our transatlantic service between the Northeast and London with additional frequency. We also moved into state-of-the-art, wonderful new terminals at LaGuardia and Orlando, and recently secured our third slot pair at London Heathrow. Our ESG efforts continue to lead the industry. Last quarter, we announced our most aggressive emissions reduction target yet, with a plan that would effectively reduce our pre-seat emissions in half by 2035 compared with 2019 levels as part of our recently announced science-based target. 
JetBlue is the only U.S. carrier today to be flying regular domestic flights with fuel supplied by both currently available SAP producers, while supporting a portfolio of emerging suppliers with significant forward commitments. We also made great progress on our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Our external customer research shows that JetBlue ranks number one for diversity and inclusion in accommodating travelers in our focused cities. And in our Gateway Direct program, open to our crew members aspiring to become pilots, people of color represent 82% of our classes. As we look ahead to 2023, we are capitalizing on the strength of our trusted travel brand to drive record customer engagement and continued revenue momentum. We are making steady underlying progress on our long-term initiatives to structurally improve our profitability and enhance our long-term earnings power with a low-fare offering that appeals to a wide range of customers, supported by our growing traction on our cost program. This gives me great confidence that we can restore margins towards 2019 levels as we move throughout this year. Beyond 2023, we look forward to transformational long-term value creation for all of our stakeholders with the acquisition of Spirit, which will allow us to create a truly national, customer-centric, low-fare challenger to the big four airlines. This will enable us to bring more of our unique value proposition to more customers across more destinations. As we said before, we continue to expect this transaction to close no later than the first half of 2024. Moving now to slide five. For the first quarter, which is a seasonally travel period, we've projected an adjusted loss of between 35 and 45 cents per share. We expect continued revenue strength and execution on cost reduction efforts throughout the year, with a margin trajectory approaching pre-pandemic levels as we exit 2023, despite significantly higher labor, costs, and fuel prices. As a result, for the full year 2023, we expect to generate between 70 cents to a dollar in adjusted earnings per share, which is inclusive of a new pilot deal that we hope will be ratified very soon. This full year EPS guidance reflects the improvement that we expect throughout the year and highlights the one-way earnings profile of the standalone business into 2024 as we execute on new and existing initiatives across the business. The contribution from our Northeast Alliance will continue to ramp in 2023. We are so encouraged by the improvement in economic growth in New York as measured by GDP after lagging the rest of the country last year. At the same time, both JetBlue and industry capacity in the region recovered more quickly than the rest of the U.S. in 2022, which provides a sequential tailwind in 2023 as that growth matures. We continue to see incredible momentum in our loyalty program, which continues to not only exceed our expectations, but also hits new records. We recently announced the evolution of our True Blue loyalty program, which Joanna will elaborate on shortly. With respect to our network, we are planning to take delivery of four A321LR aircraft this year to support our continued transatlantic network expansion. We are very excited to launch service to Paris this summer, marking our second transatlantic destination and our first in continental Europe as we build customer relevance from our key focus cities. Our JetBlue travel product subsidiary took another fantastic step forward last year with 59% revenue growth versus 2021 and 136% revenue growth versus 2019. This progress is a result of continued product innovation across JetBlue vacations, travel insurance, and our new Paisley platform, coupled with increased customer awareness. When we started JetBlue travel products, we set a target of $100 million runway EBIT by 2022, compared to $15 million of EBIT in 2019. I am so pleased to share that we are near the $100 million with consistent 20 to $25 million of quarterly earnings with growing momentum into 2023. We continue to be optimistic about the growth potential of this business and aim now to roughly double our current runway EBIT in the next three years. Finally, we continue to make strides to transform our cost footprint. 
We remain on track to deliver $250 million of total cost savings through 2024 with execution on our structural cost program and our fleet modernization efforts, which Ursula will touch on here very shortly with more detail. In closing, I would again like to thank our crew members for your dedication and all of your incredible hard work in 2022. I am so optimistic about how we are positioning the business for long-term success and so proud of the role that all of you have played in that. We have a strong foundation in place to execute on our plan to structurally enhance our long-term earnings power and create value for our shareholders. With that, Joanna, over to you. Thank you, Robin. I would also like to thank our team for the hard work, day in and day out, and for the incredible job in closing out the year strong. You've persevered and navigated through many challenges this past year, from severe weather events to ATC outages, all against a backdrop of historic demand for air travel. We also made great strides this year to improve our operational reliability. Following our operational reset last spring, we made investments and embraced a more cautious operating planning philosophy, which has served us well, as evidenced by our execution in the back half of the year. And I'm very pleased to report that our completion factor for the month of December was north of 98%, which puts us at the top of the industry, an incredible achievement. Turning to slide seven, for the fourth quarter of 2022, capacity grew 2.4% year over three, in line with our initial expectations and despite severe weather across our system. Looking ahead, we continue to see results from our operational investments with strong completion factor trends as we continue to operate in a challenging ATC environment. We expect capacity to be up 55 to 8.5% year over year, both for the first quarter and for the full year 2023. Our capacity growth this year will largely come from increased utilization, which should also drive improved productivity. As always, we will remain nimble with capacity as the year progresses and take decisive action through the lens of margin. Given the continued fragility of the aviation ecosystem, we continue to plan our operation with a level of conservatism for the foreseeable future, including schedule buffers as well as increased crew reserve levels. Last year, our network focus was primarily centered on ramping our Northeast Alliance and delivering on its promise, bringing low fares and great service to more communities and boosting competition in the region. Growth from the NEA far outpaced overall domestic industry capacity growth, bringing enormous consumer benefits in the process as we have successfully created a true third alternative for customers in the region. And during the fourth quarter, we announced exciting news with plans to add more destinations and choice out of the Northeast as we strengthen our footprint. Looking ahead to 2023, we also plan to add service across other non-slotted focus cities where we see meaningful margin opportunities. We expect to continue restoring our Boston network and increase capacity in Florida and in San Juan. We are also building on the success of our Mint franchise with further expansion at Los Angeles, as well as the launch of service this summer to our latest transatlantic destination and Europe's most visited city, Paris. In the fourth quarter, revenue per available seat mile was up 16.1% year over three, slightly better than our mid-December investor update, fueled by strong close-in demand to close out the year. The robust underlying demand trends, combined with the solid execution of our commercial initiatives, drove the highest full-year revenue result in our history, despite operational challenges in the first half of the year. As we kick off 2023, we are pleased to see the demand environment remain strong into a seasonally trough period. For the first quarter, we are forecasting revenue to increase between 28 to 32 percent year over year. Looking further ahead, we are excited to continue building on last year's record performance as we expect another strong year of revenue growth ahead of us, underpinned by robust leisure demand and multiple network and commercial initiatives. I am pleased with the early performance of our transatlantic service, which remains ahead of our expectations. Meanwhile, our Mint cabin remains a bright spot, with Mint RASM continuing to outperform core, as you would expect, and all of our A321neo deliveries this year are in the Mint configuration. We are also pleased with the early performance of the NEA, 
Last year, we more than tripled our number of daily flights at LaGuardia compared with pre-pandemic levels, a tremendous amount of growth in a very short period of time. And these new markets will continue to ramp throughout 2023. We expect the earnings contribution from the NEA to increase over the coming years as this service matures. Turning to loyalty, this part of the business is performing exceptionally well and is on a very encouraging long-term trajectory. We saw yet another record in co-brand spend last month, and we continue to meet our strong growth targets. Active customer engagement with our True Blue program is also at historic highs, reflected in the number of active cardholders and program activity. We achieved our best year ever in program enrollment, which was up 50% year over year, while co-brand signups were up 40% year over year. In December, we also announced the exciting new iteration of True Blue, which is launching later this year. Our new program is designed to appeal to a wide variety of customers, whether you are a Mosaic member or travel just once a year. It is a truly differentiated approach to loyalty, as we give more opportunities to all customers to earn rewards faster, drive utility through more options and choice, and increase their engagement with the program in True Blue. The evolution of our True Blue program, including the launch of other airline redemptions and a new credit card portfolio, also supports our evolution to a travel brand, as our customers can earn points and qualify for Mosaic when booking travel beyond just flights. This is an important driver of our multi-year journey to grow this revenue stream as a percentage of our total revenue base and close the gap to best-in-class loyalty performance. I'll close with another huge thanks to our crew members for going above and beyond every day, no matter the circumstances. The investments we have made positioned us well to reliably deliver the JetBlue experience, and this year is all about execution, from planning our operation to delivering our day of performance and to executing numerous revenue initiatives. And in doing so, we will build a better and stronger JetBlue for all stakeholders. Ursula, I'll now turn the call over to you. Thank you, Joanna, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to add my thanks to our dedicated crew members for all of their hard work in closing out the year on a strong note. We achieved another quarter of profitability as our teams delivered for our customers. At the same time, we've been focused on building a 2023 plan to create a stronger JetBlue for all of our stakeholders. Turning to slide nine, our return to profitability in the second half of 2022 was an important milestone in our recovery. We effectively navigated a very challenging year, having set ourselves up for success back in the spring with an operational reset. And we've seen vastly improved operational performance and reliability since then. While we are expecting a net loss in the seasonally weaker first quarter, we're very confident that we're on a path to materially improve our financial performance through the remainder of 2023 and deliver a full year adjusted profit. We remain laser focused on executing the commercial and operational initiatives Joanna outlined, plus our ongoing cost discipline. We're pleased to have reached a tentative agreement with ALPA to extend our collective bargaining agreement for two years which our pilots are currently voting to ratify. This gives us planning certainty, and we believe this deal will ensure JetBlue remains competitive while facilitating a smooth transition to eventual joint CBA negotiations following our acquisition of Spirit. Our 2023 outlook for Chasm X Fuel and earnings per share assumes the estimated impact of this pilot deal, which is worth approximately one point to Chasm X Fuel in the first quarter and approximately three points for the full year. For the first quarter of 2023, we are forecasting Chasm X Fuel to increase 2 to 4% year over year. Our non-fuel unit costs would be up 1 to 3% year over year when excluding the impact from the CBA. Importantly, we are still on track to deliver on our prior goal to flat Chasm X fuel this year when adjusting for the three-point impact of the Alpha deal. Last year, we launched a new structural cost program to help mitigate other cost headwinds and set an optimal cost foundation to support long-term margin expansion. 
These cost pressures are primarily related to maintenance and rents and landing fees, which are collectively worth a two-point headwind to Chasm X fuel in 2023 on a year-over-year -year basis. The Structural Cost Program is well on track to deliver roughly $70 million in cost savings this year and $150 to $200 million of cost savings through 2024. Our work has already delivered roughly $30 million since launch, and we expect savings to accelerate throughout 2023. Some of the most meaningful drivers of this year's cost savings include improved productivity, optimized maintenance work scopes, and enhanced productivity across work groups through our enterprise planning function. We also expect over $40 million of savings through 2023 and $75 million through 2024 from our accelerated transition from E-190s to A-220s. Combined, this brings total cost savings to $250 million through 2024. In addition to the higher labor costs, we're working hard to offset cost pressures from higher rents and landing fees tied to operating and growing in high-cost terminals across our high-value geography, as well as elevated maintenance activity given the age of our fleet. Turning to liquidity in the balance sheet on slide 10, recall that we ended the third quarter of 2022 with $2.3 billion in liquidity. And in the fourth quarter, we paid down $114 million of debt, funded $324 million in capital expenditures, and made a $272 million prepayment to Spirit shareholders. We also signed an agreement to become a minority investor in the new JFK Terminal 6, which closed in November. As a result, we ended the year with liquidity of $1.6 billion, or 17% of trailing 12-month revenue, excluding our undrawn $600 million revolver. For 2023, we expect cash outflows related to the monthly spirit shareholder prepayment to total approximately $130 million for the full year. We're forecasting full year 2023 CapEx to be approximately $1.3 billion, consisting mainly of aircraft CapEx as we continue to modernize our fleet. This forecast assumes 19 aircraft deliveries this year. It's worth noting that much of our capacity growth this year will actually come in the form of restoring utilization. So if we do experience further aircraft delivery delays, we don't expect such delays to drive meaningful changes to our full year capacity guidance. We remain very focused on maintaining a healthy liquidity balance. Given continued economic uncertainty and fuel price volatility, we intend to finance a portion of our aircraft deliveries this year rather than using cash. That said, our long-term balance sheet priorities remain unchanged. We plan to generate solid earnings and operating cash flow this year, and following the close of the Spirit transaction, we expect the strong pro forma cash flow profile to support a quick deleveraging of the balance sheet from what we still expect to be a very manageable level at closing. Turning to slide 11 for a recap of our financial outlook for the first quarter and full year 2023. We have discussed most of, most of these guidance ranges already, but I want to touch briefly on fuel, where we continue to see significant volatility in both oil and crack spreads. Last quarter, we executed some fuel hedges to protect against a spike in oil prices. As of today, we have hedged roughly 9% of our planned consumption for the first quarter of 2023 and will continue to be opportunistic going forward to help mitigate our financial risk. Given the volatility in the futures and regional markets, such as New York Harbor Jet Fuel, we have decided to provide a range for our fuel price guidance moving forward. To conclude, 
I'd like to thank our team once again for all of your efforts to position us for long-term success. We're driving continued momentum from the back half of 2022 as we move into a stable and more normalized backdrop this year. I could not be more excited about the path we've laid out. We expect to generate our first full year of profit since the pandemic with an EPS in the range of 70 cents to a dollar. This guidance implies significant momentum in earnings as our initiatives ramp and we deliver margins close to 2019 levels later this year. And we believe our quarterly EPS run rate this year beyond Q1 is a better indication of our normalized earnings power into next year. The strong underlying revenue environment combined with our continued execution on optim optimizing costs gives me great confidence that we are on a path to generating strong margins and enhancing our earnings power. And we will work diligently to prepare for the acquisition of Spirit, which will only build on the strong foundations that we are laying today. I truly believe we are extremely well positioned for significant long-term value creation for our owners and all of our stakeholders. With that, we will now take your questions. Thanks, everyone. Joanna, we're now ready for the question and answer session. Please go ahead with the instructions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star followed by the one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star followed by two. And if you are using a speakerphone, please lift the handset before pressing any keys. First question comes from Michael Lindenberg at Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Oh, hey. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess two questions here. Joanna, just the first to you, um, you know, you talked about the NEA, and you said, you know, you're expecting another year of ramp. I think, Robin, you sort of echoed that as well. Um, any sort of financial details or anything that you can provide around that to give us a sense of baseline or maybe where it's going? And, and if you're loath to give us financials, you know, anything maybe like, number of passengers who connect per day between the two carriers or maybe one or two or three load factor points on your planes are tied to, you know, their American customers, et cetera. Just anything that we can sort of assess how it's ramping. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, we're not going to go into the financials. Um, it's obviously still in ramp up, and we're very mm -hmm. – um, uh, in a very good place given where we are in the trajectory. Um, you know, maybe a couple things worth calling out. Um, JFK will be at a combined NEA flights 290 in, um, in April. We'll be operating 190 of those. LaGuardia will be mm -hmm. at a combined 190. Um, we will be operating 52 of those, which triples our daily departures uh, compared to mm -hmm. 2019. And then uh, growth, obviously, in Boston as well will be at 220 in April from a flight uh, departures perspective, um, with JetBlue approaching 150. Um, so we're seeing uh, the NEA very much on the correct trajectory, um, a strong number of connecting passengers. We can go offline with you um, on specifics regarding that, um, but we're very pleased with the performance of the NEA and um, the acceleration it's given, frankly, to, to, our New York, uh, to our New York markets and their recovery. Okay, great. And then just second question to, to Robin, um, just on sustainable aviation fuel, Seth. Um, it, it does seem like that you guys have done, you've been actually pretty aggressive in going out and sourcing future needs, and I suspect that as we move forward, some of these, you know, sort of benchmarks that um, the administration is pointing various industries toward um, will become mandates. And it does feel like that we could get to a point where there is very much a real shortage of SAF availability. Where, where are you on, on, on what you need to get to? Um, I think it's 10%. I think a lot of it is what the industry is aiming toward in 20, 2030. How much of, of sort of where you are and, and what are your thoughts on that about, you know, potentially leading to a shortage where, you know, carriers will have to rethink about, you know, their growth plans and this may be only a few years away. Hi, Mike. Uh, good morning. No, great question, and uh, thanks for asking um, asking mm -hmm. it. Yeah, you're, you're, so to, to set the baseline, you're right. The, uh, the industry target in the U.S. is 10% uh, of staff by 2030. Um, it is going to require a lot of ramp up from where we are today to, to get there. Um, you know, I think that um, 
Uh, I, I don't believe that a mandate uh, is on the horizon or required mm-hmm. because airlines are very willing to buy this uh, fuel. Uh, they're well, very willing to make commitments. Um, and also, you know, the, uh, in the last year or two, we've seen a lot of uh, willingness from uh, corporate customers as well to participate in some of the additional cost of buying staff, which is, again, making it easier for the airlines to commit and, and corporates to also continue traveling. So that together with some of the, uh, you know, federal incentives that we saw uh, roll out last year, you know, so I think everything's moving in the right direction, um, but there's a lot more that um, needs to be done. As you would expect, we are in conversations with all the major producers uh, frequently, and, uh, you know, we're very active in, in acquiring SAP when we're able to, uh, to, to do that. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Savvy Sip at Raymond James. Please go ahead. Savvy, your line is open. You can proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, Ari. Thank you. Sorry, I had my mute on. Um, just on the, the comments around kind of increasing utilization to grow capacity and, and that should kind of help productivity, could you uh, provide a little bit more color on how this still kind of compares to you know, 2019, given that it, it sounds like you're, you still have a lot of conservatism here and, and what we could kind of expect throughout the year? Does that get better as we head into 2024 or is this kind of a new normal? Yeah, thanks, Avi. Uh, thanks for the question. So you will see utilization improving relative to 2022 levels, but we will still be um, operating at a lower utilization level than 2019. We're very cognizant of the overarching operational environment and the need to ensure that we are protecting the operation, and that includes both um, aircraft time but also investments we're making around pilots um, that are, you know, we made in 22 that will continue into 2023. I will say, though, those are improving from a productivity standpoint, so we are peeling away some of those investments, but we will not return to 2019 levels from a utilization perspective or from a, for example, pilot resources or some of the buffering and the padding that we're putting in. Is that, John, I like, do you think as you get to the end of 2023, is that what you expect to be kind of the new normal, or are you hoping that just things will ease as, you know, the next few years as well with ATC hiring and things like that? Yeah, we're not expecting things are going to ease. I think, you know, frankly, two weeks ago was proof positive of some of the challenges that um, that we are experiencing overall in the airspace that we fly into. JetBlue has significantly higher um, amount of exposure in that in the Northeast Corridor, um, where nearly two thirds of the ATC delays are present. Absent a step change from um, the FAA in terms of technology or the ability to handle. Um, uh, the ATC throughput. We're planning for a more conservative approach. We are very um, connected with the FAA. They've been great from a transparency perspective and a communication perspective, but at the end of the day, we need to ensure that our operation is protected. So you will see us continue things such as incrementally more reserves, a higher percentage of out and back flights that enables a cleaner cancel if we need to um, when we are in a um, disruptive situation. Um, trying to base more flying out of crew bases, um, and then, you know, JetBlue's investing in some system improvements as well and have been for, for quite some time, and then obviously spirit and diversifying our network. So bottom line, for the foreseeable future, you should expect that some of these costs that we laid in in 2022 will carry through into 23 and beyond, although they are easing a bit as um, we return to a, a new normal, but it will not return to 2019 levels. That's helpful. And if I might, just you talked about the True Blue revamp as well, and it was kind of somewhat unique. I was just kind of curious, you know, what's the, the goal around some of the changes that you make made, and, and how do you expect that to kind of flow through kind of either purchasing behavior or travel behavior? Sure. You know, one of the things that we've been focused on is how do we um, really reward and incentivize all different types of customers, not just the customers who fly us frequently and who are mosaics, but also the customers who are infrequent and try to um, try to engage them. So customers will have the ability to pick the perks that they like, um, and that includes customers who fly infrequently. Um, we also are providing additional layers of um, mosaic um, 
uh, levels, which we think will incentivize some of our most loyal customers. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a holistic approach to our loyalty program by bringing benefits to customers who fly JetBlue. And then customers will also use the co-brand card, which is such an incremental, uh, an important part of, uh, important part of our loyalty, uh, program. If you think of loyalty overall in Cobrand, it represented 10% of our total revenue. We continue to see um, that increase quarter over quarter. We're very excited with the positive momentum that we have from Cobrand and True, True Blue, the new True Blue program will only amplify um, that, um, that, uh, that momentum that we, are, that we are seeing. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Jamie Baker at J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I was um, impressed that on United's call, um, Scott gave your operations a shout-out. Just wondering what's really driving the improvement in operational integrity. I know in American's case, you know, paying pilots double time for Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, obviously helped them. I don't recall JetBlue doing that. So was it really just the more cautious, scheduling that Joanna mentioned in her prepared remarks, or is there a labor component to the improvement in uh, operations? Yeah, maybe to, to give you some visibility, Jamie, thanks for the question. There's a few things going on. I think first, from a planning perspective, we are trying to plan more conservatively, recognizing that we um, are disproportionately impacted with delays given the geography that we fly into. So that's kind of the first thing, and that includes everything from increased level of reserves, so when things start to run late, um, our crew doesn't time out and we can replace crew to protect the operation, or in some cases, double crew if you need to, um, to some of our one-a-day markets in the Caribbean. Um, a higher percentage of out and back flights. That's a really important part of how we plan the schedule, um, particularly with the airspace we fly into, so that if we do get into trouble, we can cleanly cancel um, a flight. And then, as I mentioned to Sabi, increasing the number of flying out of places where we have crew bases. Um, which makes it easier to recover and get additional resources when um, we need to. The other piece that we've been on a multi-year journey around is modernizing the systems that we have in our operations center. I'll use an example. Um, last year, we introduced a new crew solver, which enables us to repair um, canceled flights and broken pairing, crew pairings more quickly, which ultimately means that we can recover faster um, and take advantage of the resources that we do have without having those resources time out or, or lose track of them. So our focus has been on the blue sky days, we need to be great, um, and on the IROP days, the regular operation days, where we have, you know, cr frankly, more than most, um, we need to better manage how we plan for those days, how we execute day of, and then how we recover. Um, over the holidays, you saw a very uh, clear focus on driving for completion factor, um, but also recognizing that when you start seeing lengthy delays, um, you've got to take quick action and, and address those lengthy delays so that they don't bleed into the following day and the day after. So it's multi-pronged planning, day of operational execution, and then ensuring that um, our crew members understand and know the plan and are prepared to execute to it. Thanks for all that data. And second quick question, you know, American and United, excuse me, American and United, uh, you know, both clear that their 2023 forecasts do assume that revenue and GDP recouple to pre-pandemic levels. You know, as a younger, growthier airline, I've never really framed JetBlue against this particular measure. But I do wonder if it's something you look at internally when coming up with your forecasts for the year. Good morning, Jamie. This is uh, Dave. I'll take that one. Um, GDP hey. is an important component in our revenue forecasting, so we certainly use it. Um, and for 2023, we have a pretty cautious forecast, along with the consensus estimates back there, where we actually have a recession, um, you know, a mild one for the consensus in the first half of the year and, and relatively slow growth throughout. Um, but we have not – we're still looking at a year-over-year -year basis. We have not pegged our revenue forecast to relinking what we saw pre-COVID. And if we did, there would be quite a bit – or if we see that, there would be quite a bit of upside on revenue. So what you're seeing from JetBlue is this year-over-year -year GDP – combined with the JetBlue-specific revenue initiatives, um, continued contribution from the NEA, ramp up of loyalty, ramp up of JetBlue travel products, um, those alone get us to our um, the, the forecasting guidance. Okay. That's very helpful. I'm glad I asked. Thanks. 
Thank you. Next question comes from Catherine O'Brien at Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for the time. Um, so slightly altering what I wanted to ask based off your, off your latest response to Jamie, Dave. So you, you just mentioned that, you know, part of what's driving that revenue outlook is improving NEA, JetBlue travel, loyalty, et cetera. Can you just give us, um, you know, how many points of tailwind you think that might be into 23? Um, good morning, Katie, and thanks for the question. Um, I, I don't have the exact in front of me points of tailwind. Um, I, I, you know, I, we're, we're certainly talking low single digits, so just to give you um, a general idea of it. Um, the NEA has become measurably uh, margin positive um, over the past half year, which is terrific. It, it was more of an investment in the first early days. Um, but it was measurably positive back half of last year, and we expect that to continue to accelerate, you know, probably less than a point, uh, but certainly measurable um, on that front. Um, and then the other piece I just I just talked about as well is the other big input into the um, GDP, excuse me, into the revenue forecast is competitive capacity. Um, and as we think about how competitive capacity ramps up throughout the country as we recover, um, keep in mind that over half of JetBlue's flying is in slotted airports. And that capacity all came back last year um, when the use or, rule, use or lose rules came back into effect. So um, in those slotted airports, which are half of our flying, there's capacity limitations um, that might have a disproportionate impact on the competitive capacity we see this year um, versus the industry at large. That's great. And maybe just a related follow-up on, on the Northeast Alliance. So, you know, I might be oversimplifying this, but, you know, American just called out on their call. They don't expect – any further recovery um, from contractual corporate travel over this year. And, and, you know, to my understanding, Northeast Alliance is, is you know, mainly aimed at better serving corporate clients out of Boston and New York. Can you just walk us through where the upside from the alliance comes to JetBlue of contractual corporate revenue is expected to stay at current levels? Thanks so much for the time. Sure. Thanks, Katie. And, and overall, um, we – we have a relatively small part of our total revenue coming out of contracted corporate share. So this is a smaller pool for us than, than the, the industry at large. Um, we are seeing measurably in our internal data as well as in the public data that's out there that JetBlue is taking share um, from, uh, you know, in the northeast um, as a benefit of this. So we're, we're seeing it in our new accounts. We're seeing it in, in higher share from our existing accounts, and, and it's a bit visible in the public data, which is, of course, delayed. Um, versus what we have proprietarily. Um, so as we continue to see the Northeast ramp back up, um, we expect to see uh, a, a bigger pie in general. And then with JetBlue's added share, um, that will certainly help us um, grow in these geographies um, a bit more than um, the industry overall. I'll also add from JetBlue's perspective, this isn't just about growing business. It's also about growing leisure for JetBlue. If you look at the route announcement we've made, we are collectively growing business, but also leisure and VFR, uh, VFR route. So in all scenarios, we would be better off with the NEA um, than without the NEA, and, and there's flexibility within that. So you've seen a number of new route announcements out of LaGuardia that are beginning later this spring. You know, that's reflecting a pivot to some more leisure destinations. So at the end of the day, this is for JetBlue, and think about our network footprint in JFK specifically, um, and to a lesser degree in LaGuardia, this is about both business, but also very importantly, leisure. Super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Dan McKenzie at Seaport Global. Please go ahead. Oh, hey. Good morning. Thanks. Um, so, a couple questions here. The last comment in the script regarding earnings momentum later this year, leading to. I think you said normalized earnings power next year or something to that extent. Um, are you using 2019 as, as a proxy for what normalized margins uh, could look like? And I guess, you know, the reason I ask is, you know, they were they ranged, you know, from basically 10 to 20 percent in the last cycle. So I'm just, you know, wondering if 2019 is a, a fair proxy or perhaps something a little better than that. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the question. So I was referencing as – we continue to build momentum throughout 2023 in the back half of this year. Our intent is to build our margins close, very close to 2019 levels. So um, that's the first benchmark, right? Um, coming out of COVID is achieving um, a margin level equivalent to pre-COVID um, with the intent 
beyond 2023, continuing to grow margins uh, over the long term. So we have a lot of conviction in our, our top-line forecast in the JetBlue specific revenue initiatives, as well as delivering on the structural costs to get back up to those 2019 margin levels in the back half of this year. Mm, okay. Um, and then, you know, I guess following up on, you know, Jamie's question, the, you know, embedded in the outlook this year is continued contributions from, from the NEA. Um, you know, I know you expect to, to win the case, and, you know, based on how it played out in court, my sense is, you know, JetBlue will probably win as well. But, you know, if there is an adverse decision, you know, what's built into the full-year capacity and, and revenue guide, and, and should we expect it to change, um, you know, based on, on that on a potential adverse decision? Hi, Dan. It's uh, Robin. Uh, I'll take that. Um, yeah, no, we, uh, we, felt good. we felt good about the case that we uh, – we put forward. You know, I, I don't really want to speculate on the, the, the downside because, um, one, we felt we put a very case forward, a uh, good case forward. You know, I think everyone in Boston and New York is enjoying more JetBlue flying uh, as a result of the NEA. They've seen more routes. And, you know, back to the question earlier, uh, it's largely leisure because there were all there were so many leisure markets out of New York that we never had the ability to serve before without taking away from something else, and we can do that now. So. So many people have enjoyed the lower fares and the more uh, choice. So, you know, it's hard to foresee a negative outcome. It is possible, clearly. You know, it, it, it's going to be down to the judge, and he's going to make a decision. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, if, if, if that comes to pass, you know, we'll, we'll look at it. There's a number of options, and we'll, we'll deal with it. But, uh, you know, we're, we're focused right now on uh, hoping for a positive outcome and continuing the momentum behind the NEA because it's brought so much more competition and so much, so much more benefit to everyone uh, in the New York and Boston catchment areas. Mm, yeah, understood. Thanks for the time, you guys. Thank you. Next question comes from Dwayne Benningworth at Evercore. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. I appreciate the questions. Um, just on fuel, uh, which I guess was marked on the 13th of January, how do you calculate uh, the jet crack spread um, and if you calculated that, you know, today or yesterday or something before you were in the crush of earnings, um, where, where would you estimate that to be in a, in a more recent time frame? And, and is there any hedge benefit uh, embedded in the, in the fuel guidance? Good morning, Dwayne. Um, so you're correct. We marked fuel on January 13th, and this is consistent the same day that we historically marked fuel for our Q4 earnings call. Um, if we were to mark as of this past Friday on the 20th, um, we would have about a 15 cent higher impact in the first quarter. So that's just about over one point of margin in the first quarter. Um, on a full year basis, we're obviously still within the upper end of our range, even marking for last Friday the 20th. Um, how we mark fuel, so the prompt 12 weeks, um, are off of the forward curve, and then beyond those 12 weeks, we actually use Bloomberg consensus. And the latter part of your question, there is a small hedge benefit vetted into the first quarter due to the 9% hedges that we have in place. Great. And then um, maybe one for Robin, uh, as you work down the path of the Spirit merger and, and learn more along the way. Uh, both about the process uh, and about spirit. Um, any change in thinking about how complex this is going to be? I guess a, a different way to ask it. A anything you you learned that you wish you knew at the beginning of the process? No, th uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, no, I mean I think as as you know, um, uh, these are incredibly complicated affairs. I think the good news is that there are have a lot there are a lot have gone before us, um, and um, you know we're always able to. When you're following somebody else, you're always able to le learn from what worked and what didn't work. Um, we already have our integrated management team uh, in place. Uh, there's uh, a number of work streams uh, going on. We have a team appointed, and I couldn't be more delighted with some of the work that's already underway um, to prepare uh, for this. You know, we are um, working on an assumption of regulatory flows in um, 2024. Um, we also have to go through a single operating certificate process. Um, you know, in recent mergers, that's been a 12 to 18 month 
timeline after close, but you can start preparing for it now, which we have started to, to do. Um, and we've got a pretty good understanding of the sequencing of decisions and, you know, what decisions we need to take when to, to make this process as efficient uh, as we can. So overall, it's early. Uh, there's a lot of wood to chop, uh, but I couldn't be more pleased with the start uh, that we've made. And the, the partnership between the JetBlue and Spirit teams has just been uh, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question comes from Connor Cunningham at Malias Research. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the time. Uh, just on Dwayne's question on, on fuel, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, 40% of your of your fuel, I think, has historically been sourced in New York, um, and that market's been particularly volatile um, recently. And I think it, there may be some more volatility coming up. There's a refinery going offline. I'm just curious if you've thought about how you may source fuel differently in the future, or is that is it just a function of where you're flying out of mostly and so on? Yeah, thanks for the question, Connor. Um, you're extremely correct. In terms of the volatility has, has been um, pretty significant. Um, historically, New York Harbor has ranged anywhere from 7 to $0.08. Cents. Um, and just here last year, the average was about $0.48. Cents. Uh, and in January, we're sitting at about 53 cents. So we actually go through um, an annual tender process whereby which um, we determine um, which markets and which lines and indexes um, to purchase fuel on. So there is a potential opportunity for us to shift if it's cost effective um, some of our purchasing off of New York Harbor, just given that it continues to be extremely volatile. So we do go through an annual process and we'll evaluate um, that uh, mid-year. Okay. Hopefully it didn't add too much work for Joe. Um, just on, on, the, uh, on the, the cost cadence throughout the year, when we think about – I'm just trying to figure out if there's any lumpiness in maybe your maintenance schedules or, or anything like that. Um, like, does it, does, is it pretty smooth throughout the year? Um, and then is there an offset from the structural cost program that kind of matches up with a lot of that? So it's, a, again, like a smooth chasm X profile. And then just thinking about the exit rate there, like why – I mean, assuming that not, – not, not taking into account your pilot deal, but just like assuming how that would trend throughout the year uh, as you think about it into the fourth quarter. I realize there's a lot there, but if you could just provide some context. Thank you. <laughs> it goes about five <laughs> different questions, Connor. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in, re in regards to – has an X in 2023, 1H versus 2H, there's about a one-point step up in the second half of the year, and that's driven by two factors. Number one, we do have a pilot CBA pay rate step up in the fourth quarter, um, and we also have some lumpiness in regards to the timing of our maintenance spend, which is typical, right? So um, those are two items that are the main drivers in the one-point increase between 1H uh, and 2H. Um, the structural cost program builds pretty consistently throughout the year. So by the end of the year, our intent is to achieve the $70 million in run rate savings, and there's really not – much lumpiness to that, like I said, is pretty um, consistent between 1H and 2H. Hey, uh, just just to get you know, because I think um, I think all the questions on cost, um, you know, are very um, have been very well put. And I know Joanna touched on this earlier, and it's come up with other airlines. But you know, just to kind of help people understand the sort of the investment going into some of the um, um, benefits around uh, reducing operational risk. So, you know, Joanna talked about the ability to have more pilot reserves and starting up pilots. So, you know, approximately every five every 5% 5 of additional pilots that you're hiring to fly the same schedule you had uh, before, uh, that's going to be just over a point of uh, chasm um, in, in, in the year. Um, every time you take utilization down two points of what you had before, that's about a point of chasm in terms of impact. So these, these investments are quite meaningful, and, and that's why you're seeing them in the, the underlying chasm. And, you know, we do have optionality over time to dial some of those back, and Joanna alluded to some of that being dialed back this year. But, 
you know, you know I, I'm not sure that we can run uh, certainly this airline like we did in 2019. And so we're going to have to be very measured and very thoughtful and, and frankly, find other opportunities in the cost structure uh, to, uh, to allow us continuing to, to make these uh, investments. We have seen the benefit. Now, you do see other benefits with these investments. So, you know, if you have higher completion factor, you have more on-time performance, that's going to help your operating costs. You know, you'll, you'll protect more revenue because you'll be able to um, – uh, have less in vouchers or refunds or travel credit. So, you know, the, the benefits are there, but it's going to, I think, mean a different revenue and cost profile in terms of where you spend, how you spend, and where you see the revenue benefit to perhaps what we were used to pre-2019. So there are opportunities over time to bring those costs back down, um, but we're going to have to tread into it very carefully um, to make sure that we're not sort of going back to uh, some of the challenges that we saw and others saw earlier in 2022. Appreciate the contacts. Thank you. Next question comes from Helene Becker at Cowan. Please go ahead. Helene, your line is open. You may proceed with your question. Hi. Uh, thanks very much, operator. Um, Robin, on the spirit, I, I get a lot of questions from ARBs who don't understand why you are planning for a first quarter or first half 24 close, um, when it seems perfectly obvious to me that it would be in the second half, you know, first half of next year versus second half of this year. So, so maybe you could go through some of the hurdles that you have to go through before you can get the approval. Well, yeah, so, I mean, um, I mean, there's really uh, two outcomes. You know, we, we're able to reach an agreement uh, with the Department of Justice, and if we do that, it's possible that could happen sooner, but the timeline is down to the Department of Justice, and we certainly want to be respectful of that. Uh, the second scenario is that we don't get a, an agreement with the Department of Justice, and they um, decide to uh, sue us, and uh, we go to court, as we did in the NEA, and that process can take several months to, to, to go through. Uh, and so I think uh, for both of those reasons, an assumption around closing this transaction in the first part of 2024 is the, is the right one to make. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. And then um, as we, we think about the balance sheet, this one's probably um, for Ursula. It, is there an opportunity to accelerate debt pay down, or, or is that not something you would consider? Good morning, Hawaiian. Um, We have a significant CapEx commitment this year. We have $1.3 billion. We also have approximately $130 million associated with the spirit prepayment. And then in addition to that, we have regular scheduled debt payments. So it's actually a pretty meaningful cash outflow this year. Um, and given that, we're pivoting our strategy to go from purchasing aircraft with cash uh, to financing. Um, so the intent uh, is to fund the business, um, but also build a healthy cushion to help support the purchase and the integration of Spirit as well. So at this point in time, um, we're not looking at potential debt paydowns. I would also note our, our weighted average cost of debt is extremely competitive, and given where rates are today, um, we're actually probably in a more beneficial place than paying down uh, low-cost debt. So um, the answer to your question is uh, no, we're, we're going to fund the business this year and prepare for the integration. That's helpful. Thanks, Ursula. Thank you. And the last question comes from Chris Stathalopoulos at Susquehanna International Group. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, Joanna or Ursula, on the capacity guide for 2023, could you break out the the moving pieces there, so departure, stage, engage. I know you spoke about utilization driving uh, a big piece of that. And then it also sounds like, again, I think you said this on the uh, – or you suggested this on your last call, but it, clearly calling it out this time is that it, it sounds like the the ASM guide for this year is, is essentially de, uh, de-risked as it relates to um, delays in aircraft. So am I interpreting that correctly? 
Sure. So maybe I'll start. So the full year guide um, is five and a half to eight and a half. So midpoint is seven. Um, the majority of this, as I noted in my script, is driven by utilization. So utilization is going to be up compared to 2022 as well as um, 2019. As Joanna highlighted, utilization will not yet get back to 2019 levels given we are planning conservatively. Um, in relation to the aircraft deliveries that we're taking this year, the planning assumption is 19. I'll note they're very back weighted. So we take five in the first half of this year and then the remainder in the second half of this year. So my commentary in the script is even if some of those deliveries in the back half of this year end up slipping, we don't view our full year capacity guidance at, at any risk. Um, so that's generally how to think about um, the full year guide. In terms of um, gauge and stage, um, stage is coming down slightly on a full year basis year over year, um, and gauge is going up slightly on a year over year basis. Um, so all in all, we feel extremely confident in the full year guide. Okay, thank you. And then on my follow-up again, uh, Ursula or Joanna. So the, the planning more conservatively um, with respect to the scheduling, and you talk about flying out of uh, points there, uh, emphasizing where their crew base is and to drive operational stability and integrity. So is this part of what, you know, uh, you know, the transition plan, if you will, for this year? Or is this the, the, the new go-forward operating plan? And if so, and I think Robin uh, was uh, implying to this in a comment from two questions ago, contemplate it with how you're thinking about your long-term uh, RASM uh, and CASMX assumptions. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take and then I'll flip it to Dave on the RASM assumptions. So this is contemplated in our longer-term uh, planning view. Um, unless there is a step change in capabilities that we see um, within the airspace that we fly. Um, two, you know, two-thirds of the delays in the U.S., in the, in the national airspace in the U.S., are um, largely in JetBlue's network. And so these planning assumptions um, contemplate that it stays relatively the same with, like, modest improvements but nothing um, substantial because we just don't see a step change in capabilities coming in the next um, next few years. Dave, on the RASM. Uh, sure, and, and just to go a, a bit deeper, Chris, I mean, some of the things we're doing around um, scheduling more out of crew bases has just been swapping of aircraft type. For example, we've largely moved our E-190 flying out of Florida um, as we soon will no longer have E-190 crew bases there, um, whereas we used to fly a lot from non-base locations in Florida before then. So that, that's one example. Um, also working very closely across departments to plan further ahead, years ahead, um, so that when we think about big infrastructure that we'll need, we're planning it earlier with both the revenue in mind as well as the operating team. So I think it's just good um, additional robustness we're doing. I don't expect material rasm impact from any of this, but I do expect better sort of cost and just general efficiency as we have more robust cross-functional planning even further ahead than today. And I think if you look at the holiday period, that very much played out in terms of the strong completion factor performance we had and our ability to deliver um, on, you know, the revenue plan that we had. And so, you know, to Robin's point, you know, this is the new normal for the foreseeable future, and we're going to plan this way, and there are benefits that we will see uh, play out in completing the schedule um, and not incurring many of the costs that you would otherwise incur if you're running late and or having to cancel flights and, and the revenue of loss. I mean, I'll give you a real-life example. Let's talk about last night. So we had weather come into the northeast. We were in ground delay programs and ground stops at all the New York airports. The ground delay program at JFK reached over three and a half hours, which means every domestic flight coming into JFK last night had an average of three and a half hours of delay. Uh, there were 749 cancellations in and out of the U.S. yesterday. JetBlue was three of those. So our ability to kind of complete that schedule, because we had planned more resiliently, executed well on the night, clearly drives that, you know, the, the benefit of having not to refund those tickets, not the expense of rebooking, uh, those customers. And I think the operational, a more conservative operational philosophy uh, changes just not how we have to think about operational costs, but over time uh, will drive some benefit on the commercial side as well. Great. Thank you. 
Great. Well, thanks, everyone. That concludes our fourth quarter 2022 conference call. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference call for today. We thank you for participating, and we ask that you please disconnect your lines.